and welcome back. It's now 15 minutes away from 7 o'clock and I promised before the break, we're sitting down to speak with representatives from the Ministry of Health about vector control and mosquito-borne diseases. And joining us for this conversation, we have Francis Wesley, who's a Dengue Technical Officer from the Ministry of Health. And we have Dr. Russell Manzanero, who's the Epidemiologist from the Ministry of Health. Uh, good morning, gentlemen, mm -hmm. and welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. Now, it's unusual when we're having a conversation around <laughs> this time of year about vector control. Uh, usually, immediately, people think that something has gone awry. But let's talk about mosquito-borne diseases and just what's happening in terms of the initiatives from the ministry. Uh, well, I believe, um, well, whenever we talk about vector-borne, we always think about dengue and malaria, but uh, we don't realize now that we have the, the situation with chikungunya. And um, well, now we, we're talking about Zika. So um, initiatives that have started in the Caribbean, for example, at, at CARFA, which is a Caribbean public health agency, we work closely with them. Uh, they have um, continuously updated us on, on surveillance that we need to um, implement in the country. So uh, talking about our, one of the main ones actually was uh, malaria. So we, uh, we've seen a, a very big decrease in, 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 the, in the cases of malaria. So I think Mr. Wesby can talk about that a little bit more. But um, I do believe that what the vector control has been doing in its programs is very effective. So we've seen a, a big reduction in those cases. I th I'm talking about 1,000 cases that we had uh, some years ago, and now we're, we're having only 13 cases for this year of Is that countrywide? That is countrywide. So it's 13 cases for this, for this year. Uh, mainly we see them in the, in the northern parts of the country, Corozal and Orange Walk. Uh, similarly, we're seeing those cases of dengue in, the, in Corozal as well. So uh, probably what, what, what we're looking at is that um, because the, 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 the population that are in those areas are mostly mobile, so they tend to have that interchange. They, they, the laborers no? that work in the northern parts of the, of the district. So they, they continue to have those cases imported from Otan Blanco, you know, from neighboring Mexico. So um, the initiatives that have continued are geared more towards um, the vector control and what, what they're doing, so, so let's me. Yes. Okay. Um, in the late 60s, we had malaria. We were at the similar point, uh, juncture that we are now. We had malaria almost eradicated from the country of Belize. There was a gradual resurgence which started in the north and in the south. And we kept seeing more and more cases up until 1995 when we saw 10,000 cases of Vibax malaria and 411 falciparum malaria, which is cerebral malaria. That is the one that will kill you. Mm. We have been working constantly at those figures where and we've seen significant reductions over the years when you say working what does that mean it uh, means um, interventions like um, supervised treatment for patients residual spraying to get rid of the infected malaria mosquitoes which is the anopheles albimanus it means a lot of health, health education follow-up we've started a new initiative also last year which is bed net distribution and so, as I said, over the years, we've seen significant reductions. Last year, we, had, we ended up there with 19 cases of malaria. We haven't had falciparum malaria in this country for, I think, the past six or eight years. Um, but we had 19 cases of Vibax malaria last year. This year, all indications are that we'll end up with 13 cases. And um, so, as I said, we've made significant inroads in, in, in terms of that. What, that we, what we credit it, uh, our success to is that, like, for example, now that we have a reduced number of cases, we can supervise the treatment of the cases. We, um, with one case every month or every two months, we have our people go every day and see that the patient is treated. We do a lot of health education. We do a lot of screening. But I think that before I hand this back to Dr. Manzanero, it is important to know that our surveillance system is still 
up to where it was even before we saw this reduction. We still go out, we still look for cases, we still contact what we call our voluntary collaborators. These are people that live in the villages and our community nurses aides. Last year, I think we took something in the ballpark figure of 26,000 malaria samples. And out of that, we had 19. This year, we are about 24, 25,000, and we have 13. So it's not that we are not looking. We are looking, as a matter of fact, when, when you see reduced number of cases, you should look even harder, I'm sure, Dr. Manzanero. Now, it's interesting because we're talking about malaria, but it has pretty much fallen out of the public active vocabulary in terms of worrying about malaria. However, dengue, on the other hand, is something that still causes uh, concerns. Given the fact that you're talking about another uh, mosquito-borne uh, disease as well, why have we not had uh, uh, a parallel kind of decrease, given the fact that we've done a good job of eradicating uh, breeding areas or even the mosquitoes um, themselves? Um, the difference is, uh, well, w one of the things that we, we tend to notice is that uh, the vectors might be different. Uh, you, we know that um, the one for malaria is the Anopheles, and uh, well, the one for uh, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika are pretty much um, the, the Albopictus and the Aedes, no? Aedes so Aedes. That, that, that can be a little bit more challenging. We're, we're trying to see... So what we employ in terms of uh, the uh, spring does not necessarily eradicate all mosquitoes. Maybe I can add something here. <laughs> for malaria, there is an approved prescribed treatment of 14 days. Mm -hmm. As a patient, the patient will take that treatment for 14 days, and then that's it. That patient no longer has malaria. For dengue, there is no specific treatment. treatment. You treat the symptoms. You will give the patient medication to alleviate the headache and the joint pains and things like that. What, number two, the, the Aedes aegypti and Albopictus mosquitoes are considered domesticated mal ma mosquitoes. They live near humans. They will live in a locker. They will live under the bed. So it's harder to get rid of them. The difference with the spraying is that with malaria, we do what we call residual spraying. We apply insecticide on the inside wall of the houses. The mosquito, once it gets a blood meal, the mosquito cannot fly far, so it will land on the wall where it will absorb the insecticide through its legs mm. and it will eventually die. That spray is not a knockdown spray. With dengue, we do, we spray with a knockdown spray. That's the machine that goes around, mm -hmm. the ULV machine. And we also do, if there is a house with a case there, we'll do what we call a perifocal spray. We'll mm -hmm. get a number of houses around where the case is and we'll spray. The, inter the reason for that intervention is to get rid of the mosquitoes that are infected at that time with dengue. But there is no set treatment that you will give the patient at the time that will make that patient non-infective to mosquitoes, unlike malaria. Malaria, once we even suspect so we have a case. the person has to run the course. Yeah. And it's still And it's still to infected to mosquitoes. Hmm. While with malaria, you give the person what we call a presumptive treatment. Uh, as soon as we suspect the person has malaria, and it's supposed to render the person non-infective to non-infected malaria, uh, 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 mos mosquitoes. So that is why it is easier to control malaria. Dengue is still out there as an elusive disease. And what have we been seeing in terms of the trends with dengue? Has it been a situation where there's a decrease? Uh, there are different types of dengue, and which is the one that we see more of? Uh, yes, uh, well, first of all, um, dengue, there, there are four serotypes. Uh, we haven't had a specific study here or test that we do in Belize to say which is a specific serotype. Uh, so we continue to, continue to see uh, dengue on a, on a general no? Uh What we're seeing now is, is it's not a trend, but actually uh, before we were seeing that it was seasonal, that there would have peaks areas whenever they would have uh, 
and no. then ra rain or you mm. notice that, that then they would have the increase of incidence. Well, we're having uh, rain now all year round. All year round. So, so that's that pretty much now that the, the trend is pretty much maintained. It's constant. So we keep seeing dengue cases throughout the year. Um, it's not as, uh, w what we take a control of, we see the past years to see how it compares to this year. And it's not actually a, a severe outbreak, but we keep seeing the numbers and we keep hearing it. Uh, the only difference is now that we're seeing, uh, it, it was pretty much concentrated in Belize City, like malaria. But now we're seeing um, that it's, it, it keeps in Corozal, we see it in, in Cayo, and we're seeing it down south. Pretty much areas that uh, you notice uh, that the rainfall has, you know, the flooding and everything that, that has maintained. Uh, we haven't seen increase of cases with, with, um, with the recent flooding, so probably we're just waiting to see if anything should change. Of course, we know with climate change, everything is changing as well, so we, we, keep, we need to keep our surveillance you know, up with all of that. If I may add, it might be of some comfort to some people that because of what you mentioned, we, 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 we are seeing rain now right through. The, when, when it started in September, this is December, and we are still having a lot of rain. We have therefore decided to continue with ULV spraying. Okay. We are spraying even as we speak in, in all the districts and as many villages as we can in an effort to in alleviate the suffering brought on by mosquitoes and also to control any future or present dengue outbreak. That now you talk about uh, it being as a result of domesticated uh, mosquitoes that coexist <laughs> very, uh, they move in, right? <laughs> uh, pretty much. So let's talk about what people can do in terms of individual responsibility uh, to help control yeah. uh, dengue, for example. Uh, well, I just wanted to share with you, um, just uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mr. Westby actually got a call from someone that nothing is being done in their, in their area. Uh, they haven't seen any kind of uh, spraying or fogging, so people think that once they have that, everything, you know, you, you take care of the, of the mosquitoes. As he mentioned, the mosquitoes are here. We're not going to ever get rid of them. So, but what we can do as a community, the community has to be a little bit more proactive as well. And I think that's the basic and, and uh, everything, that it all depends on us, right? That we need to actually um, get, a, get, get a sense of uh, uh, involvement Everyone should do their part in their own yard, around their yard, in a neighborhood. And that's the reason why right now we're looking at um, what we call integrated vector management, that we need to look at different entities, not only the community, but we need to get involved with other businesses and schools and, and see what we can do as a community to, to, to help clean up the area, to help get rid of, of those pockets of uh, uh, no, uh, stagnant water that, that is around. Um, but that is what we have to do. We need to start cleaning up our, our, no, our yards, uh, do campaigns, uh, get the message out there, you know, some more education to schools. And that is all a part of what we call the integrated vector management. And we need to get involved, uh, not only the community, but other entities as well, NGOs and, and, and others. Now, um, you're talking about uh, sustained efforts and collaboration with different communities. Uh, is it more a rural kind of a challenge or because you're talking about the migration of these diseases from Belize City proper, so is it more in the rural areas that we're seeing challenges and why? Um, well, what, what we were seeing before uh, um, that um, Belize City, for example, had a very high incidence of uh, malaria and dengue, but um, the efforts that have been put into place specifically in, in, in the areas of uh, the south side, for example, uh, has, has shown to, to be effective. The numbers have decreased. Uh, right now, we're tending to see that it's more rural. So we're trying to look at, at those interventions and work with more community workers to see how that can be, you know, we can get it out there as well. Now, let's jump to the other uh, diseases that are little known. And, and I'll mm -hmm. talk off, start off with chikungunya. Um, of course, we saw uh, cases uh, in the Caribbean first, and it really, uh, you know, got people worried because of the impact perhaps on tourism. Yes. What are we seeing in Belize and in the region? Because we've had case, uh, countries in the region where it has been a serious problem. Uh, um, how many cases have we seen okay, um, in total in Belize? Uh, like you mentioned, it's something that uh, it's, everybody talks about it because it's affecting tourism. 
Uh, being a part of the Caribbean, we know that we depend a lot on that as well. Uh, for, uh, when it started in, in the Caribbean, we pretty much were concerned that it would somehow come to, to us. We are in the center of everything, so everyone can, can come in, be, be it air, sea. So, uh, for example, in 2014, we had seven cases of chikungunya. Uh, two were imported cases, so we knew that they, they actually came in from neighboring countries. Uh, pretty much they were identified from Las Flores, mm -hmm. uh, that's in the Cayo district, and they were from El Salvador. So those two cases were monitored. Uh, for this year, we've had uh, three cases. Uh, the recent one was uh, probably like a week ago that it was confirmed, so we're still looking into how that happened. Um, but we do believe that um, chikungunya is, is somehow being misdiagnosed, that the numbers aren't that true. The numbers are too low, so we're, we're believing that even though we have that dengue uh, numbers quite high, that chikungunya is still out there as well. The reason why, why I'm saying this is because uh, the amount of suspected cases of dengue that, we, that we've had in country is probably over 3,000. So whenever someone goes to the, to the, to the doctor, for example, they, they have the similar rash, uh, joint pain, the, the muscle aches, uh, quite similar to chikungunya. So whenever, uh, we believe that whenever they go to the, to the physicians, or, or they, they usually, the first thing you think about is dengue. So you either just say dengue and you ask for a test, and, and that's pretty much what you test for. You don't think about chikungunya. And why, why is that? Has the uh, health sector not caught up in terms of uh, looking at chikungunya and what it really means and it, the similarities perhaps with dengue? It's quite similar, the symptoms. So pretty much what we need to do as a ministry is actually have more sensitization and workshop with the physicians and healthcare workers uh, and, and let them know that the, 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 the chikungunya is out there. Uh, one of the things though that we're seeing is that the testing is, is not being carried out uh, at our labs. Uh, we don't have the, the kits per se. Uh, we had, but then uh, we ran out of them, so we actually have to send them to CARFA, that's in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. So the turnaround time that we get to get back a result is, is pretty much a long wait. How dangerous is it when compared to dengue? Because for some people, the minute you hear uh, there's a suspect or suspected case of dengue or that you're infected, people get into a tizzy because they take it very seriously. But mm -hmm. chikungunya is even though it's pretty serious, uh, people don't necessarily, I'm talking about John and Jane public, actually worry about it as much as they do about dengue. Yeah. Uh, well, chikungunya has, is a little, bit more, it's a little bit more mild. It's not as, as severe as dengue. Dengue can have some very serious complications. Uh, but with Zika, it's pretty much an acute uh, illness, so it's pretty much a short period that you have. A chikungunya. Chikungunya. So uh, what we're seeing, though, is that the, the long-term effects of chikungunya can be a little bit more than dengue. People can continue to have that joint pain and, uh, you know, for a very long time. So it, 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 it tells on you, but then what we look at is, de is dengue, which is a little bit more severe. So we're not said that you, you need to keep down your guard, you know, it's still <laughs> something that you, you, you still have to be very careful about as well. And I think one of the messages we get across to people in, as far as dengue is concerned, is that it can be pretty dangerous. You get dengue the first time and maybe you contract dengue type 1. The second time or the third time it might be dengue type 2 or 3. And a combination of those can cause dengue hemorrhagic fever that can quickly get out of hand mm -hmm. and, and some years ago, and I like to bring this up, in Salvador there was this situation where they had, and, and everybody always say, I always bring this up, but I think it's important. They had an outbreak of dengue in some of the villages. People were bringing in their children to the hospital and the doctors were not aware that there is dengue out there. They were treating these people these kids and send them back, sending them back home. They would get back to these rural communities and by the time of overnight they would get very, very sick and by the time they bring them back to the hospital, they would be going into shock. They lost 24 kids before they realized exactly how serious the situation is. And in Belize that can happen. So we let people know that. We let people know you have to take care of your family, you need to go out. And as Dr. Russell say, it's easy because you can go into the lab, 
you can, a doctor can refer you and you can get a dengue test and it will test positive or negative, you will know exactly what the situation is. With chikungunya, we have to send it out to Carver, it takes some time. If the farms are not properly filled out and anything like that, this, this, this sample can be rejected. Mm. Those are some of these. Now, you're talking about, uh, with dengue, it's a danger of getting a reinfection. Is that the case that generally uh, people who may be exposed once will more than likely be ex what is the probability of them being exposed <laughs> again and infected uh, we can't say uh, because uh, the, the possibility of getting infected uh, you can get it four times the four stereotypes but it has a lot to do with how you actually maintain your entire area it has to do a lot with your community and your home and how you keep the, the yard and everything. So the chances of, of getting reinfected is, is far, far less if you follow the, 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 the prevention measures that, that you know of. So I mean, you, you travel a lot, so that can still, the possibility of still being reinfected is, is still there. We just can't say how much is it. Now, you were talking also about chikungunya and you were talking about whether there were imported cases or domestic cases. Yes. That distinction in itself, um, how do you make that distinction? And is that the, the, the rationale behind saying that it is here? And uh, because you said last year, I think, five were domestic and two were two imported. imported. Uh, well, at the ministry, we, we have a, a vector control, actually. We, we, we do our surveillance. So what we do is contact tracing. They have uh, public health officers who go out and they will do a complete investigation at uh, uh, the case. They look at the history of the, of the patient. And one of the more the prevalent uh, questions that we ask is your travel history. Have you been out? Uh, how long were you away? Anybody in your family sick? Uh, has anybody been out? Uh, so things like that. Uh, we look at the incubation period. So when Which you- Which is? Uh, f sorry? For how the incubation uh, well, period for- Chikungunya. Chikungunya. Well, it's quite similar to dengue. Dengue, chikungunya, it's, it's pretty much three to seven days. So uh, you look at that, that time frame that the person has been out. If the person has been out, then we try to make that link that probably that was you know, an imported case. The person actually was out. Uh, we know if they're coming from a, a, an area that, that has a high incidence of uh, chikungunya. I mean, for a fact that our neighboring um, Central American countries have that. So if that, co if that person comes in and we know that there was a travel history, we pretty much can say that it was an imported case given the time frame that we'll look at it as well. And we will look at the case. We'll ask the data for onset. Mm -hmm. First symptoms, we'll count back for the period of incubation. And then we'll ask the person where you were between this date and this date. And we can now pinpoint where that person got infected. Got infected. We do it with malaria, we do it with dengue, we do it with chikungunya. We investigate each positive case to determine where the person became infected. You have to do it because you ha that will determine where you need to increase your interventions. Now, let's, let's move into our final uh, disease, uh, that uh, Zika V. So let's talk about that and how is that similar to the other uh, two? <laughs> so because you talk about the similarities between chikungunya and dengue and perhaps even a, a, a physician might actually miss uh, diagnose that. Is it the same challenge that you face with Zika V and what are the challenges there? Yeah. Uh well, with, with Zika, um, the Zika virus uh, is pretty much from the same family. The, the, the vector is pretty much the same uh, as dengue. So we have the same challenges that you're going to talk about dengue, the same challenges you're going to see for chikungunya, the same you're going to see probably for Zika as well. So pretty much our surveillance would have to focus around those same measures that we're going to implement for, the, this, the tick, for dengue and chikungunya. So it's, it's pretty much we're looking at that. It's not something that we've, uh, there hasn't been any cases, but we do know that um, our neighboring countries already have reported cases of Zika. Uh, in the Caribbean, we've had a few in, in Suriname. So 
probably we're looking at, uh, we need to increase our surveillance. Uh, workshops have been continuous uh, in, in, in the Caribbean, so we're all looking at that. The Caribbean is actually looking to see how we can increase surveillance, what measures can be changed that we didn't catch in dengue or chikungunya for Zika. Uh, our surveillance has to increase for different uh, things that we need to look at. Probably one of the things that we need to look at is um, neurological. Uh, they're seeing a link between Zika and neurological complications. So that is one of the things we need to start increasing our surveillance in country. The so, so let's talk about Zika itself, how it manifests, and what are the dangers associated with it? Uh, well, it's pretty much, the symptoms are pretty much the same. You, you, you might have a rash and you might have a joint pain, muscle ache, headaches, uh, nausea. So it's pretty much quite similar to, to, the, to the other two. So, um, but the complications, uh, we, we haven't been studying it as well. It's something that is in the Caribbean. So studies are ongoing right now, so we need to see all of that. However, um, there are countries that have reported a link between um, um, congenital malformations in, in children and the link between Zika and pregnant women. Uh, it's not something definite, it's just something that they're seeing a link and they're trying to see if that is the case with Zika and, and that. Uh, so pretty much our, in, in, in country we have to increase that surveillance as well to keep on board with, with the no other member states in the Caribbean as well. So, Is it, is it endemic to this area or uh, why are we seeing these diseases that are not a part of our vocabulary uh, become such a threat for us? Pretty much it has to do a lot with, what, with, the, mo with the tourism and, and the mobile populations in the Caribbean. Uh, it's not something endemic in the Caribbean, it's something that ha we're seeing cases that are coming into the Caribbean and that's the way how it goes. Um, and then they become like, a part of yes, the, then it's, then the it's challenge. Here, exactly, it's like chikungunya that came into the Caribbean and then pretty much it just started spreading. You know, so it's something that um, we're looking at uh, for Zika as well. The world is just a smaller place. <laughs> you know, we have, years ago, we didn't have to worry about Belizeans, for example, traveling to Africa. Now we have, from down south, we have people from the banana plantations that go out to Mozambique. We've had a couple of cases that have come back from Mozambique with dengue. Mm -hmm. We've had a case, um, with, with malaria. We've had a case some years ago from Suriname with malaria, and those are chloroquine-resistant malaria. We've ha uh, we had one, I think, from Haiti. So if you look at Belize, it's no longer little isolated Belize. And this is how we get these diseases. What we are doing now that we hadn't been doing in the past is first we would test for malaria or test for dengue, but Kim, who is the chief of operation of this program, and myself, when we discuss, and, and Dr. Manzo, we always say, if we are taking so many slides, um, samples, example, for example, for dengue, and only 10% or less than 10% are positive, yet they have all the symptoms of dengue, what are the others? So now we, the, that testing is extended. <coughs> we are checking for chikungunya, and I guess in time, as Dr. Manzo said, we are preparing to. Is it a cost consideration uh, that we can't have it in country to have those uh, tests conducted for chikungunya and physique? Uh, uh, yeah, know? definitely there is a cost behind it. And of course the validation of the tests. We need to have it approved that we, we don't want to have any, any kits and then we have false uh, positives or false negatives. No, So we need to actually have a, valid, uh, a test that is validated. And the cost behind it, of course, is, is there, so we need to look at that. But is it not worth the, um, the investment? Yes, of course. And so. so what has been the challenge in terms of the ministry not embarking on a kind of a, I guess, a tripartite kind of testing that the minute uh, you have these symptoms because they're so uh, relatively close that you don't test someone who comes in exhibiting the symptoms for all three? Uh, I mean, William, the test is there, you know, it, it's, it's, we, we might not have it in country, but we have very close links with CARFA. So even though you come in and you... But you're talking you about a, 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 a time sensitivity in terms of sending it out 
Uh, what's the turnaround time for that when you send it to Trinidad? It probably takes a week to two. Before it was much longer. Uh, of course, um, the, the now with with technology we have it, the, the results are via email, mm -hmm. a phone call. So it's it's. But the time it takes to get there, yes, it it still takes a time. It still takes a, a while. Uh, but we do have in-country tests that we do for chikungunya, only that they need to fill in certain requirements. As uh, Mr. Westby said, that they need to have everything completed for, for you to know exactly when the date was. It, it has a lot to do with your onset of, of illness, that if you know you had a, a date that you started, you can actually capture the test and you can actually have the results. But if time has passed, then you won't pick up the results anymore. So that's the reason why we always ask, when is your date of onset? When have you, when, when, when last were you with fevers? No, so, so that is the reason why we actually have to ask those questions. If the time has passed, then pretty much your test won't, won't have, have we had any deaths uh, this year for dengue or uh, associated or suspected dengue cases? No. No? no. Um, do people still, should people be worried if they get a fever? What's the advice in terms of seeking medical um, uh, a medical opinion and treatment. Uh, a lot of people with a fever, yeah. they say, oh, I just don't feel well, uh, and they yes. leave it for perhaps two, three days until it becomes unbearable then for them to actually seek medical attention. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you that, um, <laughs> well, you know the, the Belizeans, we, we tend to actually, you have a fever, you have a headache, you stay home, you rest it off, you drink a lot of liquids, you probably go to the pharmacy, you ask for a Tylenol or something. But um, definitely, if you start seeing other things associated, if you have a headache, if you have a fever, you notice you're having a rash or, or joint pains, those are signs and symptoms that you can actually say, okay, something is not right. Uh, you go to the, to the physician, you go to your, to your um, polyclinic, and you can actually get tested. The, the doctors know exactly that we have a situation with it, so they pretty much can test for it. So uh, we advise you that if you have it, uh, if you have those symptoms, to actually ha you know, seek some medical attention. Don't, don't stay home with it. Now, I, I'm, I'm, not, um, I'm looking at what the ministry is doing, but you also have some challenges because uh, access, there are disparities in access. For example, if you live in rural Toledo or maybe even uh, rural areas up north, access to a health facility is far more difficult than perhaps in Belize City. So, and transportation might be a challenge. There's a complication of, uh, you know, uh, challenges uh, that people may have to actually. So how seriously and what's the message from the ministry in terms of people actually expending the energy to get that medical attention and get a diagnosis very early? Uh well, I believe that um, we know that, uh, for example, dengue is something serious. We can't um, wait. You know that it can get complicated. Uh, the severe form, hemorrhagic, for example, it, it starts pretty much the same. Uh, if you wait more than if you wait more than expected time, you can actually have severe complications. You go into shock, and, and you can actually die from that. So we're, we're saying that you're not supposed to let your guard down. No, look for medical attention. I mean vector control, they're actually going out. They're actually doing active surveillance so that they don't wait for the people to come out. If you, they go in and they look for cases and they ask and they, and they, they conduct no, testing as well. So and it's something Ministry that they do. The Ministry of Health has embarked on a very intensive training for the community health workers. They are well trained, they know how, what to look for, they know when to make referrals. And you talk about Toledo, for example, we mm -hmm. have a well-equipped um, satellite clinic in, okay. in, in San Antonio. There is one in San Pedro, Colombia. In, in, there is in Stan Creek, there is the one in Bella Vista. So there are clinics and they are well in, uh, there is one in Big Falls. And that is the way it is throughout the country. We, the training process is continuous. We have a very good network of dedicated people and so any, I think one of the problems is, as Dr. Manzanero said, that people wait until they are so sick before. Remember, before they go see a doctor or, or go to a hospital, remember there is a window of opportunity with dengue that, and chikungunya that you can get a test done where you will get the, the result. If you go after that window of opportunity is passed. And what's the window that you're looking at? 
Well, you start having symptoms from the third day. Probably from the third day, you start noticing that you have uh, these joint pains, headaches, and fevers, rash. Uh, pretty much, you're, we, we go, you go through a very big phase. That during that phase is when the, the viral load is actually very high, which is uh, three to seven days, three or up to 10 days. Probably when you're at the end of that uh, and you're having severe complications already, it's pretty much the, the phase already passing. So that's when you start to say, okay, well, it's pretty much a, a little bit late to come in and check that out. So from the very start, you're having these symptoms, you should actually seek medical attention. Now, um, one of the final questions I have has to do with, because of the changing patterns in terms of dengue, for example, and then the similarities with chikungunya and Zika V, uh, what's the advice to people um, in terms of looking at uh, I guess the infection um, periods and uh, how they can better uh, work with what the ministry efforts are um, to make sure that we reduce dengue and uh, chick V and Zik V. <laughs> uh, I think, well, if you look at it, it they're all uh, vector borne. So they're, all, they're pretty much linked to this one vector, the, the mosquitoes. So pretty much to, to, to decrease the incidence or the number of cases and all of that, we actually as a community need to be very proactive in what we do. Uh, we can't wait for the ministry to actually come out and say, well, we're going to fog, we're going to spray, we can't we're not to do that part. We need to put our part as well. We need to keep our areas clean. We need to have whole campaign sensitization, the knowledge across. I mean, the young, the young children right now, they're, they're the ones who actually can take out the message. They have, um, for example, in CARFA, they have apps that they use now that they can actually go on and they can learn from the game and see how they could do it. All of that is part of the sensitization and campaigns that you do to actually prevent these vector-borne illnesses. So it's pretty much a, 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 we have to be a little bit more proactive in that sense. And best practices? Uh, Burn fish in your house, spray, uh, what? Use long sleeve mm -hmm. shirt and long pants. Um, during the peak biking period, which is between like 5.30 and 8 o'clock, if possible, stay indoors, screen your houses, um, treat breeding sites. If you, there's a drain with stagnant water in front of your house, drop a little cooking oil, a, a tablespoon of cooking oil in it. We have guys that get up 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning to go out and spray. We put in the effort, but the general public have to get up and realize that 80% of the success is what they do. People need to do their part. And open up your homes when and open uh, there's, up, uh, there's de definitely, fogging. Definitely, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it um, where people say, you come around with this stinking thing again <laughs> and, and, and all that. Imagine if we were not doing that what would be the, the, the problems that we would be facing as a people. So we need cooperation. We need the public to cooperate. We've, over the past couple months, been in some of these villages where we've been asking people, don't dump garbage by the side of the streets in the villages. You know, use the garbage disposal sim system. You know, drain the water or treat the water, if, things like that. And if we all do that, we will see the reduction in, in, in dengue, and like we've seen it in malaria. All right. On that note, gentlemen, I'd like to thank you both for joining us this morning. Any final words? The, like uh, Mr. Westby is saying, we have to put our part. So as long as we do that, that 80% uh, you're going to notice that that's the success of the program. And that's one of the reasons why malaria has been decreasing. And we want to see the same for, for others as well. All right. Thank you once again. Thank, Thank you. you We're going to go ahead and take a break. And when we come back, it will be to talk about uh, the Airbender Yoga Studio online. Don't go anywhere. Open your eyes. Continue after these messages. <laughs>